Okay, so before the break, you heard about GIS on the web, and since this is a GIS and water resources workshop, today in this session we're going to talk about water on the web, and you're going to hear the other side of the story, or well, the rest of the story as uh, we used to hear. So we're going to he have a total of six demonstrations, one of them dealing with global stream flow mapping, which is being done by Tim Whitaker, talk talking about the global synthesis of uh, stream flow observations across the earth. Then global soil moisture uh, from Dan Zimbel and Michael Natchke on the web um, and on the desktop from Gonzalo Espinosa. And then we're going to shift our focus down to a regional scale at the scale of the San Antonio and Guadalupe basins, and Tim Whitaker is going to uh, deal with that, an extension of the water rights story that you heard earlier. And then finally down to the local scale and talk about desktop and web hydro tools for local areas. So let me just sketch in the background here. If you say the water data, for those of us who are water resources engineers, this is what the water data means. It means measurements of water quantity, uh, of uh, rainfall, of uh, soil moisture, water quality, meteorology, groundwater. That, and these are time series observations uh, taken at point locations. Uh, this one happens to be the Manawatu River at Teachers College, and we've got uh, two representatives from the good old New Zealand there. Uh, this happens to be the location of the longest flow record in New Zealand, uh, started in 1928. Uh, so every country collects these data, uh, but we lack a global system for integrating them. And we're demonstrating today how it's going to come together across the earth to be able to do the same thing for water observations data as you were seeing earlier uh, for elevation and other data themes. Uh, all the little different colored Darts here for Australia are some of the 37 stream gauging networks that are operated in Australia. Uh, the precipitation and evaporation in Australia are run by the Bureau of Meteorology, which is a national data collection system, but stream flow has always been a regional responsibility, and so there is uh, 37 different organisations that measure that in just within one country. In New Zealand, it's actually 17. Um, this work was supported by a project that I led for quite a few years uh, by the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science. This is a National Science Foundation project that has members from 125 universities and it advances hydrologic science in the nation's universities, doing things that are beyond the capacity for one university to do by itself. And there was a hydrologic information system project that I was the leader of, and we invented a language, WaterML, for uh, water resources time series through the internet. We built this in an academic way. Uh, some years ago, the US Geological Survey adopted WaterML, and they now operate WaterML data services uh, uh, 24-7, 365 across the whole country. And that is the data for the Colorado River at Austin, and the Colorado River at Austin at 11.30 this morning, which is 9.30 hour time here, had a flow of 72 cubic feet per second. And this kind of instantaneous information is available now um, at 22,000 locations across the country for uh, instantaneous flows, and also all the daily uh, time series from the US Geological Survey comes in this structure as well. So the US Geological Survey now has two different forms in which you can get information. You can go to water.usgs.gov and get web pages and text and the usual kind of stuff, um, text downloads of data, and you can go to waterservices.usgs.gov, which is where all these data services and service infrastructures come from. Now, when we developed this, we first built this as an academic system and then was adopted by the US Geological Survey. But in 2008, I proposed to the Open Geospatial Consortium and to the World Meteorological Organization that these things should be federated and should be um, worked on at the global scale. And actually, David Arctor, who's here, take a bow, David. Yeah, so he, he attended the WMO Congress in Hydrology in 2008, and out of that came a memorandum of understanding between the President of the Open Geospatial Consortium and the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization to work together on standards for hydrology, meteorology, oceanography, and climatology. From that came technical meetings every three months, uh, four interoperability experiments across the earth and surface water, groundwater, and there's one going on now in forecasting, uh, annual week lock, Workshops. There was one just held two weeks ago in Quebec City in Canada. Uh, so a whole international effort was launched. And in 2012, uh, a time series standard for 
one variable at one location called WaterML, the ODC WaterML was announced. So this is the first public standard that has ever existed for the exchange of water information. And you know, I feel emotional about that, even though that's kind of cool. Water across the earth in a, in a common language. We've never had one before. So there are many people that have been involved in this, and the, I, the Australian community was very much involved besides ourselves in the, in the United States. Um, the Global Runoff Data Centre, KISTIS firm that's represented here, and Geological Survey of Canada, the USGS, and others. Um, what we've then asked the question, what now? Now that we've got a standard for saying, here is a common way of being able to publish water observations data, uh, leveraging the standards of the Open Geospatial Consortium and the World Meteorological Organization that builds on GIS and water resources as a domain knowledge that we've been running this seminar for 20 years now. How do we then catalog all of that stuff so that it can be accessed across the earth in a common way? So that we can just say, okay, I put my stuff there and it's in, a, in an accessible catalog. And there's something called GEOS, the Global Earth Observing System of Systems, that is a global catalog for geospatial information and the World Meteorological Organization has a similar catalog for uh, climate data and weather data and so on. And so we're working with those organizations now to provide global cataloging services uh, in an open standards format for uh, water observations data. Once that happens, then you can search in the GIS portal and find maps of observation points, and you can also federate them in ArcGIS Online and start doing cool stuff like what we were just seeing with integration of geospatial and temporal data services. And there's all the countries that you see here are uh, involved in this project, and uh, the Global Runoff Data Center, which is based in Koblenz in Germany that collects data across the world, uh, has uh, information at these uh, points, um, but not all of that is web service enabled yet. So what we're working towards is a global system for integration of water data, uh, and we're fo focusing on stream flow as our main, uh, as our first theme, because no global system exists for that at the moment. Um, later on uh, this afternoon, you're going to hear a little bit more about the New Zealand story, and uh, Brent Watson and Sean Hodges are here. Take a bow, guys. Yeah, they've come all the way from Palmerston North, New Zealand, yeah, which is near where I grew up. Uh, and they're going to show how they've published their observations data for their regional organization in New Zealand. And there are 16 regional agencies, of which theirs is one, that collect water data and one national agency. So even within little New Zealand, a dinky country with 4 million people and 250,000 square kilometers of data has 17 water databases. And so just building a water system that integrates water information within New Zealand is an important national objective. So this is not just about global, this is also about integrating things within countries and doing a better job. Uh, Italy, for example, has 21 regions. They don't do any national data collection. The whole country is divided geographically into 21 regions, and so building a national infrastructure for Italy is a task that they're engaged in. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn over to Tim Whitaker, who's going to talk about a time series on point observations uh, globally. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. I'm using the Watershed Explorer app that you saw earlier as my platform for demonstrating this idea of having global stream flow observations. In this map, I've zoomed into the area around San Diego, and I have some green dots in my map which represent stream gauges. If I click on this dot on the San Diego River, with this app, I can get back a graph. So this was a query made live and on the fly to the USGS to pull back stream flow data for this gauge. If I look at the attributes, I can see that this is indeed a USGS site. So as you saw in the presentation just now in this demo, this is working great for the USGS. But I would like to use that in other parts of the world as well. So what if I pan south of San Diego, I get into Mexico, and I see a little green dot there. I'd like to be able to click on that green dot and give like a hydrograph as well. Well, if I wait just a sec, one pops up and the graph looks just like the same graph from the USGS, except this time, these data are coming from Conagua, the Comisión Nacional del Agua. And if I look at the download data link here, I can see the magic behind this. So what makes this work is that both of these organizations are giving me back data in this standard format called WaterML. And here's another shot of it here. It's X XML, so not too pretty for a human to read, but machines do great at this. They love this stuff. They eat it right up. Jumping back to my map, we can illustrate that we have this capability in other parts of the world as well, so let's jump over to Iceland. Join me for this world tour of stream gauges. I have a green dot here in Iceland, so I'll click on this one. 
And in a moment, I'll get back a hydrograph for my favorite site in Iceland. How many of you have been to Iceland? I have not either, so I'd, I'd love to go someday and maybe visit some of the, the waterfalls there. And, and, the, and of course, this gauge called Silfoss. So there's a beautiful hydrograph, and this time it's coming from the Global Runoff Data Center. And just like the, the previous example, if I click on that download data link, I get back that same WaterML format. This means that no matter where the data are coming from, as long as that data source is giving me data in WaterML format, this web application, this Watershed Explorer, can parse that data and generate a graph for you. I've now zoomed to the Dominican Republic, and I have a bunch of green dots here that I can click. And I should say for the first three stream gauges that I clicked on in, in the U.S., Mexico, and Iceland, those data were being published from commercial database systems and software like the, the Kister's time series software with a, a, probably whiskey for both of those cases. Uh, in this case, with the Dominican Republic, this is being published from a university with uh, Brigham Young University's help and using free software from Quasi to publish these services. But because the data all come back in watermill format, I still get this nice hydrograph here. In this case, the, the data are coming from Indri. For our final stop on our world tour, I'll go to New Zealand, of course. And I can see I have a little cluster of green dots there, so I can click on one of these stream gauges and get back another hydrograph. All this is working wonderfully today, magically, so thank you, WaterML. One thing I noticed is that the units were different from source to source, and this one appears to be in liters per second. But the units information is in WaterML, so that gets carried through to the web app. And these data are being provided with the help from the Horizons Regional Council. And they'll be speaking later this afternoon, so you can hear more about their story. You may have also noticed some yellow dots in my map. Well, the green dots are the stream gauges that we're aware of that are publishing data in WaterML. So that means they can interact very nicely with this Watershed Explorer app. But we know there are a lot more stream gauges out there. These yellow ones are additional gauges from the GRDC that aren't available in WaterML yet. And there's got to be more beyond that, too. So what I'm looking forward to in the coming years is to see more of these green lights turn on across the world so that we can enable this world, world water online of water information. Back to you. OK, thank you, Tim. So what we've just been talking about is water observations data measured at point locations. What you're next going to see is various um, displays from the NASA Land Data Assimilation System. So NASA has a system in collaboration with NOAA, and they do modeling of, water, of the surface and atmosphere water balance across the whole Earth. Uh, that's called the Global Land Data Assimilation System, or GLDAS, and also for North America, the NLDAS. And this is evaporation, precipitation, uh, soil moisture, uh, surface and heat flux, runoff, and so on. And NASA is doing this all the time and keeping it continually up, uh, continually up to date. And they have a three-hour uh, time step for the Earth and a one-hour time step for the United States. And so uh, a critical information layer uh, for, of authoritative information that's becoming emerging for hydrology is coming from this NASA land data assimilation system. And you'll hear uh, quite a bit about this as we go through the uh, discussion uh, in, uh, as it follows now. So what we want to talk about now are how can we understand web maps and charts where we've got geoprocessing services coming from GIS and time series services coming uh, from on the water resources side. And we're going to uh, examine this data set, as I was mentioning. We've got the climate information of observations, numerical weather modeling, and so on, that produces radiation, precipitation, uh, temperature, humidity, wind speed um, for the de definition of surface climate. That goes into a land surface model which has soil, terrain, and vegetation parameters, and it runs continuously to, to produce evaporation, soil moisture runoff, and recharge from 1979 to the present. For North America, this is one eighth of a degree spacing of the data and one hour in the time steps, and globally it's one quarter of a degree in three hour time steps. And so given these forcing and land surface conditions, using the simulation model, derive the surface moisture and energy balance. Now I plotted up these data for New Zealand and I was just amazed actually at how dense it was. 
there are three points here on Stewart Island. I mean, nobody goes to Stewart Island. I mean, <laughs> my mother and father went there and they, they were afraid the plane was going to fall on the ocean. But anyway, uh, there's a, an amazing data density here, even for a remote country. And this happens to be the data in the South Westland, which rains all the time and there's almost no seasonal variation. And this is the data for the area where I grew up, which you can see a pronounced variation in the soil moisture level. So what you're going to see here is quite a lot of calculation or data that deal with the level of water in the soil. And what we're moving towards here with models and with census is the idea that we can build global water maps or regional water maps to describe a water property over a domain of space and time, the history, the current conditions, and also forecasting. And we're going to use soil moisture as our example, but obviously the same kind of thing can be done for precipitation, evaporation, and, and other quantities. Uh, and with that, I'm going now to turn over to Dan Zimbel and Michael Natchke, who will show you how to do this on the web, and to Gonzalo Espinosa uh, on the desktop. So this is Dan. Great. Thank you, David. This is Dan Zimbel from Thanks. ESRI, Washington, D.C. office. Right. Um, so as David started to talk about, uh, we have this goal of trying to generate a way to access the data from the NASA GLDAS product or the LDAS product in general. But I thought for, for a consistency, we should take a quick look at the, the NASA website directly. And the GLDAS data is provided by NASA. They have a site set up to allow you to access all the different variables, including the soil moisture. And you can derive a number of different types of views into that data. So I've, I've pre-generated here a couple examples. Uh, this is a, just a two-dimensional plot of, of one average time, uh, time extent for the GLDAS soil moisture. And of course, if I want, I can also generate a, uh, a, a time series for a given location uh, for soil moisture over that period of time. Um, but uh, with, with other users wanting to have access to this data, one way that we want to represent the data is a little bit more dynamically, so we can start using services to provide these in a dynamic environment. So we've taken some of the, the GLDAS uh, data products for soil moisture, and we've created a service out of it that's time-enabled that allows you to step through all of the different um, time steps for that particular series of data. So here in a minute um, will be the uh, soil moisture data for the GLDAS for the world. It will come up. Okay, um, so this is one rendering of it, and we can represent the, the time steps and the, the monthly, so we have the monthly data. There is a lot of data here, uh, as was mentioned. Um, it actually goes to um, about, I think, 567,000 time steps for each of those uh, variables. And we can take that data, serve that out as services, and using ArcGIS Online or, or other venues, we can now create some more meaningful maps by doing some overlays. So we've taken the, the soil moisture and created a web map uh, that's using the World Hydro Reference Space Map that was talked about earlier today to give you a little more context. And then once we enable that web map, we can then share that out through applications. So again, here's our web map. And now we can animate just like we did before in the context of the ArcGIS.com map viewer along with our uh, world reference overlay. Uh, but if we want to go back to the group, you'll notice I have a couple of other services in here. One of them is the G generate soil moisture table. So we can also generate geoprocessing services that complete tasks for you. One of them might be to generate a table back so that in a web context, I now have the table of values over a given time period for a given location. And we can take those together and we can stitch them into an, uh, a mapping application. So this is the mapping application that's reading in that web map that allows us to animate the spatial variability of the soil moisture over uh, the, the area, the extent, the geographic extent. We have the context of the world reference uh, hydro base map layers also in that map context. But we've also enabled that tool and along with our partners at Kisters to be able to click on any kind of point and then we'll basically generate a time series profile for that point. So you see one that's bedded in the map here, but we're also working with Kisters to enable them to bring a lot more advanced functionality in the graphing. So at that point, I'll turn it over to my colleague, and he'll uh, discuss more about the, the Kisters capabilities. So this is Michael Natchke from the Kisters firm in Aachen, oh. in Germany. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. 
So I can. I hope you can hear me okay. So what, what's the map for GIS person is the time series graph for temporal persons. So if you're working with time series data, the way how time series data is presented is very meaningful to people who have really time series branded and stitched in their eyes in. So there are nice and more nice presentation of uh, time series data available. So what um, Dan just showed is a small widget. It's a technology term inside that widget. Uh, actually, the on-request time series data lives for a moment, as long as I have it open. So by point clicking, uh, this container is opened here, presenting um, soil moisture data for the last two or three years, available live accessing the NADA stream, and all this time series data being available through the Internet. I think this is really time series heaven to visualize them. Um, I can, can zoom in as I can zoom in into... Uh, a map, for instance, by, uh, by using the mouse wheel, for example. But I can also leave that open for a while and um, just going across the, um, the, um, the longitudes here. And maybe I would like to do a comparison um, with a, a point more further on, on, the, um, on the west here, for instance. Um, so if I click on this, another time series graph <coughs> is, is added. So I have to open this here in here and I have to access the main. This is the line below. And I can also just vary in, in time and go back to 19 or to 2008, for instance, and redraw the chart. So now I've got an overlay of two time series information. So I keep, can keep on, on walking, actually. Um, can I just put in a, a comment here, Michael? Can yeah. you show the, the graph? So what's being plotted here, the numbers on the vertical axis uh, represent the number of millimeters of water that are stored in the top meter of soil. So when it says yeah. 100, for example, what that means is 100 millimeters of water in the top meter of soil or that 10% of, this, of the soil is filled with water. And so the variations that you see here are variations in the quantity of water that's stored in the top meter of soil and they respond to rainfall and to drought and so on. That's, yeah, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's an important additional information. So I have access here to, um, let's say, three years of data, and I can keep on walking um, through um, the um, temporal presentation and adding more and more time series to it to do my comparison. Um, for each given time series I can access, I can overlay um, particular years and time, for example. So if I would like to see the, the variation um, or the annual variation over time, I can um, have, a, have a look at this to um, identify maybe more dry years from, uh, from more wet years. And I also see my current year plotting up to see, um, to compare it to, to the past, to the history. And basically, at the end of the, the story, I can also access the data directly, for instance, in, in Microsoft Excel. So it's not only imaging what's, what's going on here, it's really fetching the data and rendering it. So once I open it up in Excel, data appears here. Uh, in a three-hour grid, and this is really live performance here, um, straight into your application. Excel is just an example. It could be the Christos Whiskey application, the desktop, it could be Hydro Desktop, it could, could be any consuming application understanding the data service at the end. Okay, so let, let me just, uh, can you go back to the, the map and the widget here? So, isn't that totally cool? I mean, soil moisture across the whole earth. Yeah, I mean, yeah. amazing, amazing, amazing. So, I mean, you've got a combination here of a number of things. One is a really committed group at NASA that work on this stuff and will keep working on it and are doing it at the global scale. I visited them at Goddard, uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center, a few weeks ago, and uh, I was really inspired by my visit there because what was important is, you know, here's a group of people who have a, mi a mission to work with the whole world and with more detail in the U.S., and they're there, and they're going to be there next year and the year after, and they've been there already 10 or 15 years up to this point. So that's a very strong, uh, stable base for being able to build uh, for the future. And you know, the, the work that Dan has been doing is uh, based on new uh, capacities for being able to publish multi-dimensional data as web maps. Do you want to say a bit about that, Dan? Because I thought that was really cool what you did. Uh, so we're, we're working on several efforts to... Uh, we've been able to, to work with, you know, supporting NetCDF and some of the HDF and GRIB type databases, data sets that a lot of this data is produced in, and then you can use RTS as a vehicle for advertising those data sets as services. So that gives access to not just the scientific community, which are used to handling all of that kind of information, 
but actually provides access to a lot of other users that just want to consume the services and use it in whether application at the end. So let me, let me summarize that just for a moment. And, and let me also mention that what Michael was doing was his widget, I, I don't know, these widgets seem like they live, I don't know, up in the light fixtures or something, I don't know where, somewhere. Um, his widget was actually accessing the NASA data on the fly. And so that was, there was nothing stored there. He was actually hitting a server, I don't know, Goddard somewhere, NASA Goddard. And uh, we're working with NASA to be able to publish their information in the so-called data rods. And so what NASA has traditionally done is published grids, like I have the whole world with all my variables today. But for hydrology, that's not a whole lot of use because you're really concerned with some local circumstance and you want to say, oh, I want to know the history of what's going on at this point and I want to compare my current conditions with those that occurred in recent times so I can get a sense about that. And so this data rods project involves reconfiguring the whole information base, which is multidimensional in space and time, so that it can be accessed deep in time at a particular point for a single variable as compared to across the whole Earth for all variables today, which is the traditional way that NASA does business. And so that behind the scenes here, there's a whole another reconfiguring of the NASA database that was necessary to pull this off. So there's the regular process that they're doing, there's this re database reconfiguration thing, there's this NetCDF publishing as a uh, multi-dimensional web map that Dan showed, and there's this on-the-fly widget that Michael demonstrated that shows that you don't have to download the data into your local application to plot a chart, that somewhere in the cloud there's this thing, thing I guess if you're in Texas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bang. Um, is, can you tell us something about the, the thing? Michael, I mean, that seems like a miracle to me. Oh, it's not actually a miracle, it's quite easy to achieve, so once we are standardizing, we're simply accessing the NASA service, the fact that it stores water ML2, standardize the time series description. We simply um, uh, render the data and put this into our widget here for display, but the widget is more than just displaying. It provides you a little bit of basic time series functionality that Kister uh, is uh, very familiar with as a professional time series um, company here. Um, so the overlay plot I showed you. So this is um, generated once the data lives inside the widget for the time it is opened. And once I close it, the data is released from this local storage, and uh, then you can go uh, around the world and add some more data. Yes, please. Um, yes, so at the moment, um, it, it has the basic functionality, uh, or some of the basic functionality first, to plot a continuous time series. Uh, um, that's um, the very, very basic ones. The overlaid plot is the second one that I showed. Trend lines would be the next one that we can add there easily or showing the, the long-term values, the highest value for each January for period of records. And the time series dream can, can start now and adding more information to it. But that's, that's easy for us. And, and for those of us who have been uh, doing this workshop now for 20 years, I have to say... Um, what you just saw today was really incredible because yeah, we've had the maps for a long time, but what we lacked was the time series part of the story. And having the Kistis firm working along with Esri and being able to synthesize these so closely as you've just seen is really an amazing um, addition to our capabilities. And I, you may not get really worked up about Excel files, but I do. And <laughs> being able to just, oh, go get my data and show it to me in Excel. You know, oh, it's there. Yeah, I mean, that's so cool. <laughs> well, there, there it is. Goosebumps, <laughs> 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 <Thanks, Peter. laughs> I mean, you've got no idea what it's like to teach students, and they want to do this, right? They don't want to mess around with a whole lot of stuff. They just want to get the data and you know, go do their work. And, and I, so I see this as a very important development. Another thing that was really important to me in seeing this kind of work was um, is that soil moisture has been and is a crucial variable for hydrology, but it's been kind of inaccessible. You know, it's like, how dry is dry? And they go, well, it's really dry right now. Well, New Zealand is going through a drought. You know, well... Some places it's dry, other places it's drier. I mean, how do you say how severe things are relative one place to another? When a rain happens, how much runoff happens? Depends on the, soil, the dryness of the moisture. There's been no index for that. And so I think this, this uh, NASA soil moisture data set is going to be a really important uh, new layer in the 
Um, the Earth, I guess it is. Now we call it the Earth, right? Yeah, okay, the Earth. I'm, I'm getting with the new, the new jargon here. So is this stuff available? I mean, can we use this or is this... Yes, so it is available as part of this context, and it will show up more, more often in RTS online in the future. As uh -huh. So how are we going to do this, Caitlin? Are we going to have like soil moisture map on Monday or something, or Tuesday maybe? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday? <laughs> Yeah, and let me tell you a little story here. So, um, uh, when I plotted that map of New Zealand and showed all these charts and so on, I, I made a slide of this and I sent it off to a bunch of people at Esri and, and I copied Jack Dangerman on the on the message. I, I didn't actually address the message to him. And this is like Saturday morning, nine o'clock. Saturday morning, nine thirty. I got this message from Jack. Oh, this is great. We need to do this. You know, back and forth, back and forth. So by 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, he says, oh, I want to do this. <laughs> okay, Jack, sounds good. Yeah, we'll do this. Um, but it was amazing. I mean, yeah, he, he just zeroed in on it right away. And this you'll see tomorrow um, being presented, uh, Landscape Analyst, I guess it is. So Landscape Analyst is a new system that's being put out by ESRI for uh, spatial analysis of landscape attributes. And so... Whether this is in landscape analysis or elsewhere, the notion, Jack's really behind the idea of providing uh, this kind of information, the soil moisture information and other things from the land data assimilation in association with the landscape analyst. Okay, so this is uh, on the web, so let's move on from that and deal with the desktop. So this is Gonzalo. So if you say, well, that's cool, I don't want to just do this uh, kind of thing. Um, and be able to plug charts. I want to actually get the data myself and use it in ArcGIS Desktop. Gonzalo has developed a set of tools uh, to do that. So if we go back to the... Um, are you getting... Oh, are you ready to go? Yeah. Ah, okay. Where well, you go then. So Gonzalo is a student in our PhD program at the University of Texas, and he's also an intern at ESRI this summer and last summer as well. Okay, hello everybody. So I'm going to talk about uh, the LDAS data and how to get uh, the data into desktop for uh, an, a specific location or future analysis. Um, so how does this work? So uh, we see that we have the data provider, that in this case is NASA, and we have our GIS online. So you can access a, you can get this toolbox through our Hydro community. In, in within ArcGIS Online. And then you, you use ArcGIS Desktop to do the analysis. So the LDAS onloader. So the LDAS onloader works getting the data from NASA through the GRAD server and creates a, a set of ASCII files depending on the variable that you want and the, the LDAS flavor as, a, for example, NLDAS, GLDAS, a version one or two. So, a, I'm going to present this demo for the San Antonio Guadalupe Basin. So, uh, this basin that we presented before in Texas. So I have the basin, and then I click my LDAS node downloader. I see that the input is the area, the data source, that in, in this case is NLDAS monthly data, the variable that I'm interested, uh, like a water resources guy, I like surface runoff. And I have the, my output, output workspace and the time period. So in this case, it's for 2012. I hit OK, and the, turn, uh, the tool runs in six seconds. And I see that in the folder that I selected, all the ASCII files are created from the NASA server. So if I drag and drop August 2012 in this case, I see the, uh, the geographic di distribution in my basin the millimeters of surface runoff. And then if I want to create, what if I want to create a time-enabled mosaic data set for, for this data? So I have another tool that is a create mosaic data set. I select the folder that I just downloaded. And after the tool is done running, I see that I have the, the mosaic. But it's not only the, the regular rasters. It has a, the time feature, so you can slide through, through time and see the, the distribution. Okay. 
And it focuses in more in the LDAS soil moisture. There is another tool. And also to, to get not only the graph in a point, so to get the, the average in a basin or in a polygon in a city or in a state. So we have the, the data provider from NASA and the tool provided by us uh, in the RGIS, in the RGIS Online Hydro Community. And the output will be the time series plot and also a mosaic data set. So returning to my uh, San Antonio Guadalupe Basin, I create a time series profiler. I select the basin and the period of time that I want to, to plot. After the tour runs, uh, it's a similar plot that we see before. We have the millimeters of soil moisture in the top meter of soil. And, and also I can, uh, similarly without, the, uh, we, similarly I, I can create a mosaic data set for the soil moisture variable in this case. And it's, well, it's time in, enabled too. Uh, so this is my story. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Gonzalo. And what I've been using those data for in my class is to be able to you ask the students to say, okay, here's the mosaic data set over the region. Calculate the average uh, of a quantity over, over a drainage area. So we're not just cl uh, clicking on a point. We're actually getting the spatial average over a uh, particular uh, polygon. So it gets to the idea of annual water balance and things like that, like what we were discussing earlier. Uh, so thank you very much, Gonzalo. And how is somebody going to get your tools? Is that, are you going to yeah. talk to Caitlin or something? Or? Yes, I want to post uh, a blog post in the Hydro community. Okay, yeah. so, so this, is, this is to be continued, right? A story to be continued with Caitlin and, and a blog post into the um, uh, Hydro Resource Center. Okay, so let me... So what um, was being downloaded here, this is the uh, NLDAS uh, data set, and the parameters are here, vegetation, uh, soils, and uh, elevation. This is the fixed information. This NLDAS-1 forcing, this is the precipitation, uh, radiation, and so on. And then there's the model, which is the calculation of the soil water balance and the uh, fluxes of evaporation and uh, sensible heat, latent heat, and so on. So it's these three things. What's the physical environment? What's the forcing that comes into this for water and energy? And then what's the reaction of the land surface? And any one of the layers that is in, in these uh, data sets for the time uh, varying information can be accessed with the tools that, um, that Gonzalo has created. So there's actually a very, I mean, you want to get radiation, for example, there's a whole heat surface heat balance uh, of the earth here, uh, which Actually, I find very um, interesting because you can see short wave and long wave radiation and the balance of those on the land surface. This is really um, demonstrating the physical properties of the Earth system. So now we're going to switch to a, a little bit more of a regional perspective. And, uh, and we're going to work off of something that I'm going to call a hydro database. So in other words, I'm saying in GIS we have a geo database that we're all familiar with. In water resources, we have a time series database for those of us who are work in that field, and that's what the Kistas firm uh, does. And together, I'm suggesting these things, these quantities can form a hydro database. Now, truthfully, what that means is that uh, we've got web services that can ingest information into the hydro database, and in fact, it's two databases sitting side by side. They're actually both in SQL Server at our University of Texas. One is the ESRI system and one is the KISTA system, and they're sitting right there together. And so the web services are feeding information into this hydro database from which maps and charts can come. And that information is not just uh, data points from this particular um, uh, gauge location, for example. It also includes models, so uh, hydraulic simulation models. And so what we have done is we have been working in collaboration with the University of Illinois to take the output of the NASA land data assimilation system and transform that into uh, models of river flow on the N, uh, NHD+. So instead of saying, oh, now the soil's getting wetter and drier, oh, now I want to understand the translation of that and I want to understand what's going on in all my rivers. And so 
<coughs> I've been working on this for the past five or six years with a grad student initially, just Cedric David. Uh, he's a, a Frenchman. And this is not rapide, this is rapide, you know, some French thing. I've forgotten exactly what it... <laughs> anyway. <coughs> and the, the workflow that involves uh, getting the information from NASA and running repeat and getting the output and so on is facilitated by an automated uh, workflow application that has been developed at the University of Illinois. So actually all of this work doesn't actually take place in Texas, it takes place in Illinois. So we say, oh, go get the files from NASA and pff, you know, something happens and I'll go, uh, a web request happens and it gets the files from NASA. Go run the rapid model that happens and then go get me the output file. So there are three web requests here. So this is modeling on the web. This, it doesn't, I don't care what operating system they're using. I don't even know what operating system that they're using. And uh, this work is sponsored by Microsoft Research and Kristen Tully is here. Kristen, can you stand up and hand wave a little bit and tell us about Microsoft Research and their interest in this process? So thank you very much, Kristen. We really appreciate your presence here and the support of Microsoft in this work. So this is the San Antonio and Guadalupe basins again. And here what you're seeing is a simulation of the flow in the river system. Uh, this is for a three hour time step uh, over a three month period. And it's kind of like a blood flow in the arteries of the river system. Uh, this is five and a half thousand uh, reaches being calculated here. This is every reach that's in the NHD Plus data set. So every reach is being calculated in every three hours. So the data from NASA is being translated into uh, a service water flow um, in this particular basin. We started off in this, with this basin, and that was our first test case. Uh, we subsequently did this, uh, uh, Cedric being from France. This is a collaboration with Meteo France. And so this is the, the flow in the main rivers in France, and this is an operational model now used for weather, river forecasting uh, by Meteo France. There's the Loire and the Garonne, the Seine, and the one coming straight south is the, uh, is the Rhone. Uh, we've also been working on, uh, this is all the rivers that flow to the Texas Gulf Coast, but perhaps the, the fun one here is the Mississippi. This is 1.2 million reaches. This is running on our supercomputer center at the University of Texas. Uh, this has 500,000 processes. So this, you see on the right, uh, the Ohio, this is the upper Mississippi. Uh, coming out here is the Missouri. You'll see some contributors. Here you can see the flow coming down through the Missouri. This is the Kansas, uh, the Platte River here. Uh, this is the Arkansas River there. Yeah, so our, our goal is to eventually have a model calculating the flow in all the rivers and streams on Earth, actually, simultaneously. So. And one that they did, uh, Cedric's now in California, so if you want to see how California works, this is sort of kind of a fun one. Yeah, <clears throat> this is the drainage system of California. I didn't really realize it, but it's got kind of one major outlet that you'll see in a moment. So, which is, yeah, there it goes. Send us into the San Joaquin Basin and the flow going out into San Francisco Bay. So there's, there's where all the big water resources are of California. Yeah, you kind of get a feel for the functioning of the river system. Now all of this is produced on a geospatial data set, but as multi-dimensional data. Isn't that totally cool, huh? Yeah, I mean, being able to calculate the flow and all the NHT plus reaches. Um, is there a scale, I mean a scale in the map or? So, yeah, so that in this, I'm, I'm sorry? Uh, well, hey, if this is net CDF, you're not, not into, we're getting to that, yeah. And, and Tim is now going to demonstrate how to do this with a scale. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I can't say that I have a nice scale in my map that I prepared, but we'll get a sense of the scale when I look at some hydrographs for some of these rivers. I've got an ArcGIS.com map open, and I'm showing the soil moisture map that you've seen earlier today, and I, I just love this map. This is one of the inputs that can go into the Rapide model to 
get the data from the spatially distributed grids of stuff, of, of water information, and move it into and through the stream network. I, I just love this idea. I'm going to zoom in to the San Antonio and Guadalupe River basins here in central Texas. And I've already got this NHD river network set up to run with Rapide. And this is the, the Rapide simulation that's being run is the one that David talked about going to the University of Illinois. We asked them to do it for us, and then we just get back the results, and we plot the results here in a map. Uh, so with this simulation, what that means is I can click on any one of these river reaches now and pop up a hydrograph. So 375, I think these are in cubic feet per second. I should probably check my attributes. Yep. So here's discharge on the Guadalupe River. And then I can just click somewhere else, get another hydrograph. So every river, every NHD plus reach that's in this network, I can get the, a hydrograph of flow on it. I think I had it computing from the end of February to the present. To get a sense of how dry it is in Texas right now, I can employ a strategy similar to the USGS, where they color code their gauges based on the percentile flow in them. So blue means pretty wet for that gauge based on its history, and red is pretty dry. I've done the same kind of color coding based on the most recent flow that I've got computed from Rapide, and I'm turning on the result now. Let me turn off the soil moisture map, too. I don't need that anymore. Lots of red. We happen to be in a pretty bad drought right now in Texas. About 90% of the state is in moderate to exceptional drought, so you're going to see a lot of reds and oranges here indicating very dry conditions. If I had any blue streams, they would show up as... Uh, or any, any full streams that would show up as blue. Now to get a sense of how we can go from this kind of data to decisions, I'm going to play the role of a Texas water master. I'm turning on some USGS stream gauges. Those are these green dots in the map. And I'm also turning on the locations of water right with, or water permit withdrawal locations. These are the triangles. The triangles are color-coded based on priority. So a green tri triangle represents a water right that has priority over the yellows and the oranges and the reds. In other words, it's good to be green. Now suppose someone, maybe in this Rebecca Creek over here that I'm zooming into, one of these orange triangles, wants to divert some water from the river at one of these locations. Well, the water master has to decide, is there enough flow in this river, and can I expect enough flow in this river to allow this diversion? Am I going to keep the fish in the river happy? Am I going to keep these green triangles downstream happy? And will the river continue to support all the functions that that river needs to support? Without repeat, what I might do is try to find the nearest USGS stream gauge. And thanks to online mapping, I can see there's one here on the Guadalupe River. And thanks to water and mail, I could go ahead and get a hydrograph of that right away and, and see what's going on there. But if you look at this, that location is several miles away from Rebecca Creek, and it's on a different river. The Guadalupe River, where the USGS gauge is on, is about two orders of magnitude greater in average flow than Rebecca Creek. But thanks to Rapide, I can click on Rebecca Creek itself and get a hydrograph there to see what the current conditions are. So I see that we had a big storm in May, it looks like, but things are pretty dry now. So I'm not quite sure I'm going to allow this water withdrawal to happen. But the idea is, with these geospatial tools and services, with these temporal data tools and services, with model services, I can put together these tools that can help water masters make better decisions about where they let the water go. And thanks, Tim. So just to and put a bit of context behind this, uh, the green uh, triangles are those who people who applied for their water right in the early years. So in, in Texas, we have a legal system, first in time is first in right. So if you applied for your water right in 1901, you are superior to everybody who applied later. It doesn't matter who you are or what you did, that's the way it is. And so one of the really difficult conundrums for the water managers, uh, the water master it's called, in this basin, is if a senior water right holder calls for their right downstream and they have the legal right to get it, the state has to start shutting people down upstream. Last summer, there was one Dow chemical plant in Brazoswood, Texas, called for its water right, and they shut down 600 upstream users. Uh, in other words, they had to trace upstream for 600 other diverters and shut them down. Now, you may say, you know, Dow has that right. I mean, but 
that's what, what we're dealing with here is the combination of the uh, physical system with the decisions process, which has to go on here. Uh, another critical piece of this is that some of the water rights are for municipal supply, and Dow actually succeeded in shutting off part of the municipal supply for some cities. I mean, there's a whole trade-off here about, well, why does Dow have that right, and shouldn't the cities be superior? And it's a very complicated process. So I showed this uh, the rapid process to Commissioner Carlos Rubinstein, who's the Commissioner of the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality, who deals with this work. And he liked the flows and that kind of thing. And then I went into his office and I sat down with him and I brought up this web map thing and I started messing around on his computer and showing him this web map. And he said, oh, I like this 10 times better. Yeah. <laughs> and it was because it was transparent to him, right? There's not a great piece of software in the middle. It's just here I am and here I can start messing around with some problem that concerns our agency and the, and the issues that we've got to solve right here at this location where I've got competing water users and not enough water to spread amongst them, you yeah. know. And what we've succeeded in doing here is to be able to take uh, flows which are measured at particular locations and the modelling of the landscape done by NASA and translate that into flows in the rivers across the whole landscape for small and for medium size and for large rivers. And that's really an unprecedented thing. I mean, it's just never been possible to do that before. So anyway, thank you so much, Tim. I appreciate uh, you doing that. Now, I want also to acknowledge here a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes here because, as I mentioned before, this is a hydro database here. So what's happening here is that the water diversions, the forecasts we get from the National Weather Service that we use for this, the rapid model simulations and everything are all being ingested in a time series database, the KISTAS database. So when Tim clicked on the river reach and you saw a chart, that chart came from the KISTAS system, actually. It didn't come from the GIS. Whereas when he clicked on the map and it showed, it changed the, the, the display of the map from the blue lines to the red lines and so on, that part came from ArcGIS. So the, the, the beautiful thing about the web is that these two databases are really different. They're two different disciplines, really, two different technologies almost. But they're sitting there and they're side by side and you don't even know that, you don't care actually. Whether it's coming from the Kista side or whether it's coming from the Esri side, you don't even know whether that's true. And so this is really a fusion of GIS and water resources in a way that has not been possible before, that we've never shown in this uh, workshop before. And so I'm really excited about that. What you saw earlier from, uh, from Michael Natchke was the widget accessing data on the fly. What you saw here was uh, a map, a web map, that was going and getting services, geospatial services from the, the Esri side and temporal services from the Kista side, and they were from this hydro database that we've got set up at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm hopeful that during the coming year, Michael, hint, hint, uh, <laughs> that this goes into the cloud, right? This is not just uh, uh, something that's at the University of Texas at Austin, but we can set this in the cloud and the same capability here that is just transparent, whether you're dealing with time series or geospatial information would be in the cloud, like what the geospatial services are now. Okay, now, in the work that we're doing in World Water Online, we've talked um, at the scale of the globe. We talked about the, um, the global stream flow information at the national scale for the United States with the National Land Data Assimilation System, uh, at the regional scale for the San Antonio and Guadalupe Basins and the regional water management problems that we have there. Uh, the scale that we haven't talked about is what happens locally. What happens to me, my house, my well, my ranch? You know, how does this affect me? And this is the World Hydro Overlay Map that uh, Caitlin uh, was mentioning. I have to say, Caitlin, I'm sorry, this is like the, the old-fashioned version, not the new-fashioned version, but anyway. Uh, one of the things that was kind of fun about this map is that they found that the Amazon has seven times more water than any other river on Earth, and so the Amazon drives the cartography of the, the world river system, as it turns out. So this is the World Hydro Map for the Earth, for the United States, for Texas, for Austin, and that is my house. Uh, right there, and I happen to live next to Panther Hollow, and that is my creek. And I took that picture actually with my cell phone. Um, when I this little, this, you see this little path uh, by the left hand side here that I, I take a walk here along Panther Creek. Now, this is my creek. I worry about this creek, and you know, I want to know about the water quality here. I want to understand what's going on with my creek. A lot sometimes it even dries up. Um, so, this particular stream is important to me. And one of the things that I did with the processing services uh, was I delineated the drainage area of my creek. 
And actually, I found out some interesting things when I did that. This is there's a road here. Actually, this is how we get into our house. And the watershed goes up, and you can see the road is along the ridge lines. I didn't know that. I didn't even know what the watershed looked like from my creek, actually. So I learned something by doing this uh, process. Now, as we look at these local kind of situations, lots of hydrology and water resources work happens in local areas, and this is particularly true for urban areas. And so we're going to see now desktop tools by uh, Gonzalo Espinosa and web tools by Dan Siegel that talk about how to do hydrology uh, in the traditional urban hydrology environment for, for local areas. So, Gonzalo. Okay, hi again. So I'm gonna present the desktop hydro tools. So, okay, so the general regime of how to run these tools is the same one. Uh, we need some input data for our tools, and that data can, can be from local data or from web services. And also the tools, uh, we can get those through ArcGIS Online. So the first one, the watershed delineation. We saw earlier this morning how to, to run the tool uh, online, but also we can do it on desktop. So adding the geoprocessing service and only clicking a point, we get the basin. So I want uh, to delineate this basin in, in North Austin, the Wells Branch for the Wells Branch River. So I have the connection, connection to the server and the hydrology toolbox. I double click the watershed tool, select the point, the outlet of the basin, and hit OK. This is going to, uh, to the Esri services, and I get the output. The output is the watershed and this uh, outlet of the basin. So now, uh, with the output, I can use uh, I can use the output or the tool itself in other in other tools. I can drag and drop it in uh, in Model Builder, for example, or use the output for for as in this case for the time of concentration tool. So the uh, the difference in, in this tool is that uh, it uses the elevation service that Ezra is publishing as part of the landscape uh, new layers, and also uses the, the basin that we just delineate and get the time of concentration. So if I go back to, my, to the connection server, I see that I have the toolbox, the hydrology toolbox, but I also have the, the national elevation DEM, uh, DEM. If I go back, I see the mountain ranges uh, in West Texas and North Mexico. Uh, so and I can use this DEM, this elevation service for a uh, in, as an input to my tools. So if I go back to the catalog and double click the time of concentration, I input the net, uh, net raster as a input and my watershed. So what it's doing is extracting the DM that I want and, well, uh, processing, and I get the time of concentration display in the window. And also, it's stored the longest flow path in my creek. Uh, the time of concentration is also stored as an attribute in the table. Also, another new services that are coming up in the following days are the NLCD, the National Land Cover Dataset, and the Hydrologic Group Raster. So in this case, I, as we use the DM as an input for the time of concentration tool, we can input those two uh, rasters for, uh, as an input in, in, in order to get the curve number for, for a basin. In this case, uh, I just extract the, the data for the mob purposes. So this is a national land cover data set and the hydrologic group raster. So again, I go to the catalog and to my curve number tools. I double click curve number and I have the input. I just hit OK. And the time, uh, the curve number is displayed in the immediate window. And also, as the time of concentration is stored in, in the attribute table. So I'll give you, you know, Daniel to show the web applications. Okay. Mike. Okay. Mike. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Well, just before Daniel goes there, let me, let me just refresh a little bit, uh, show what uh, uh, Gonzalo was, was doing. So when you're talking about the pr water properties of a watershed, there are two things that we need to know. One of them is when it rains, how much water runs off. And the curve number is a mechanism that tells you that. So it's a number that goes between 0 and 100. And there's a nonlinear function that was worked out by the Department of Agriculture that says when a storm of five inches of rain happens with this curve number, which is 64, that means we get three inches of runoff. So basically it tells you, it tells you about the volume of runoff. The second thing that you need to know is how quickly does the runoff happen? And that's what the time of concentration tells you. It tells you how long does it take water to get from the farthest point on the basin to the outlet. So the length of the longest flow path that uh, Daniel, uh, Gonzalo was showing is the path that the water drop takes from the farthest point to the outlet. And depending upon the size of the basin and the shape, that varies, uh, that gives varying time of concentration. So with those two things, the curve number and with the time of concentration, you can say, okay, now I've got this rainstorm, with that I can produce this runoff. Right, so yeah, now that you've seen some of the tools working on in desktop, I wanted to take a minute to talk about how they fit into the larger ArcGIS platform. So for example, the curve number calculator needs three inputs. It needs land cover, hydrologic group code, and a watershed of interest. Now, traditionally, this would mean finding a DEM for your region, calculating the flow direction raster, delineating your watershed, and then hunting down land cover and, hydro and soils data in some federal data labyrinth somewhere. But now, all this content is available on ArcGIS Online. And Gonzalo showed how easy it is to do this. You just connect to the server, drag and drop these layers in, and then you use them without ever having to e even download the data. You're literally just accessing, the, the tool just accesses the pixels it needs and just does the analysis on the fly. So um, it, I don't want you to think about it just as a source of data, though. The platform is much more than that. It's also a place that you can republish services to and share them with everyone else. So for example, if you know a lot of people in your organization are delineating watersheds and then calculating the curve number for them, you can make a simple tool like this all I did was drag and drop the ESRI delineation tool into Model Builder, connect the output as an input into the curve number calculator, and then connect it also to these other two layers, and then you can republish that as a new service so that you know, publish it within your organization or even to the public at large, that anyone can delineate a watershed that automatically has the curve number on it as an attribute. And you'll notice in this example, the land cover is not coming from ArcGIS Online. It's, it's local data. Maybe you have higher resolution data that you surveyed yourself, or maybe it's projected data you're trying to do planning for future development, or maybe it's uh, the hypothetical land cover because you're doing environmental impact analysis on a new shopping mall. Uh, the beauty of this platform is that you can easily combine ESRI curated content with your own local proprietary data in order to make powerful tools that help you do the analysis that you're trying to do. Uh, this streamlines people's uh, workflows in desktop because instead of having these big dialog boxes that are, you know, tools as we made to be customizable and work for everybody, you can make much more simple dialog boxes that only expose the parameters that people in your organization care about and that automatically does the things that they would otherwise have to do on their own. Also, because we're doing this through, you know, we're not just zipping up tools and emailing them around like we used to be. These are web services we're creating here. And the in the platform, that means that they work interchangeably everywhere. People connect, connect to them in desktop, but they can also connect to them in web applications, which then bring your tool onto tablets and smartphones and in the internet browser. The same tool that you published works across the entire platform seamlessly without you having to create different versions of your tools for different things. The Watershed Explorer that Caitlin showed earlier is a good example of this. It's just using the same service that you saw in desktop. But you might have noticed that the the watersheds had attributes on them. When they were delineated, they automatically said, hey, here's how much precipitation this watershed gets. Here's how much of it is lost to evapotranspiration. Right? It wasn't curved number. This is a story about water availability. So we had different attributes you wanted to have on our watershed. And I figure that's a workflow that will be pretty common. So I put together uh, a Python script for making these sort of geo-enriched watershed services. Uh, you can see at the top there's just a list of rasters and what this tool does is it just uses the Esri watershed service to delineate a watershed, and then it does zonal averages over all these different rasters, and then adds the calculated values as an attribute to the watershed. So maybe you're not interested in precipitation, evapotranspiration, maybe it's population density, 
or land cover or critical habitats. The point is we want to make it easy for you to make services that streamline your analysis workflows and that tell a story. So I'm going to close with one more example that I think will be especially provocative to the hydrologists in the room. In this one, you just put an input point, it calculates the watershed, calculates its time of concentration, and then it downloads the runoff rasters from a NASA server, the, the NLDAS uh, rasters that you saw earlier, and routes them through the watershed, and the output is a hydrograph. So now you've literally made a service where someone can click at a point, enter a start date and an end date, and boom, there's the flow at that point during that period of interest. So the age of hydrology on the web is here, and that means that GIS developers are more important than ever. You guys can make tools that help engineers do things in minutes that used to take them hours. You can make tools so simple that the general public or even your boss can use them. I mean, the, the, you, you guys are doing the work up front that then saves everyone time down the road. And that is, we're trying to make it, then we're trying to save, you're, you're saving everyone else time, and we want to work to help save you time. And we're trying to make this platform easier to use so you don't have to be a super nerd to make these sort of web services. You know, maybe just a regular nerd, hopefully, can do these things now. And over the last year, I think we've really made a lot of progress in streamlining this stuff and making it a lot simpler, and hopefully this coming week we can get a dialogue going on what else we need to do so that, you know, in the future it can be even easier and you guys don't have to work quite so hard. <laughs> <laughs>